when when we met last week at the luxury technology show, uh, you told me the story of your father, and I'm sure there are plenty of stories. We could take the whole hour talking about that. But interestingly, the story of your father and how that got you sort of into the whole music business is quite fascinating. So uh, why don't we start there? Right. Well, um, you can't see it because I'm on this uh, laptop and over on the wall, actually, on the other side of my office, apart from some of the gracious awards I've been given, is a, a picture of my father in the ring in Yankee Stadium in 1937 uh, fighting Joe Lewis for the world title. It Man. Was, yes, it was Joe Lewis's first title fight. My father had fought Braddock, Jim Braddock. Lewis had beaten Braddock uh, and taken away his title. And my father's fight with Lewis in September of 1937 was the first title defense for Joe Lewis. At any rate, it was a 15-round Donnybrook, and you can get it on YouTube if you go Tommy Farr or Joe Lewis. Uh, and it actually has the full 15-round fight. And a uh, tremendous. And uh, talking about fighting, in those days, they were three-ounce gloves. So it was very different from these fights we pay $160 to see on HBO channel or whatever, and uh, the fighter has had his fight and is off at the discotheque in Vegas for the night <laughs> afterwards. Um, I think my father and Joe Lewis for three days afterward uh, at home piddling blood. Um, they, 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 they were tough, tough fights. Anyway, my father, who in many ways is, is not just my hero, and I see you've brought it up on there right now. My father's the guy on the, on the right. He's, he's the white guy. Yeah. Um, so uh, the, my father was very, very successful as a boxer, but he was, for me, much more successful as a, as a husband to my mother and as a father to me as his son. And uh, unfortunately, living in Anglo-Saxon England, my brother and I, being the son of the heavyweight champion after the war, I was born in 42, my brother was born two years later, <clears throat> everybody wanted to put a notch in their belt by kicking in, in, in the pubs. They love Friday night. They don't, they don't feel they've had a good night unless they've had a punch up. And they were always looking to pick on my brother and I. And one, one particular night, and I won't go into too many details, but there was five taxi drivers having a pint before the late night shift. And uh, they thought they'd have fun with the Far Brothers. And um, I don't know, I just, something snapped in me and I, I got too aggressive, <clears throat> for which I got into trouble. And it got into the national newspapers because my father was so famous and it was like Tommy Farr Jr., blah, blah, blah. And my father, who was very understanding, and he said, look, Richard, as he called me, he says, Richard, uh, here's, I'm getting you a passport and I'm going to give you 100 pounds and I want you to go away and see, see some of the world and come back when you can control your emotions. And you're going to get this because I'm, a boxing champion. You're going to get people wanting to contest you via me. And, I, and he said, you just have to learn how to deal with it. So I got a passport and I got a hundred pounds. I went off to Sweden. Long story short, I got asked to leave from Sweden for, for silly reasons. And then <laughs> they, de they deported me to Denmark where uh, I got a job and unfortunately didn't have a work permit. So they deported me to Germany. And this was in September of 60. And I arrived at Grosse from the ferry from Denmark. And I had about eight Deutschmarks to my name. And I thought, right, I can go down to the Siemens Mission or the YMCA and sleep for the night. And I'll go and get myself a chili dog. And as, if you've ever been, and this was in Hamburg. And in most German cities, in the center of the city, they have these carts with like these little umbrellas where they sell these wonderful chili dogs and brat first and vice first. So I'm standing in line, a line of three or four people and I'm waiting to order my, uh, from the guy in, in front of me, I'm waiting to order my chili dog. And I suddenly hear this voice behind me go, Oh, I know who you are. You're the boxer's boy. You were in trouble. I saw you in the newspapers. And I turn around and I'm going, oh, here we go again. And he goes, Hey man, you know, I'm John Lennon. I'm with the Beatles over at the Indra Club. And I'm like, okay. And I kind of took to him and I bought my dog. He bought his and we were munching it. And he, he says, come on over. 
So I went to the Indra Club, and uh, the, this is before, uh, this is when Stu and Pete were uh, in the band, and actually Ringo was playing in the same club with Rory Storm and uh, the Hurricanes. Um, this is before the Ringo had joined the Beatles. And I hadn't really known what I wanted to do in my life. You know, I knew I, had a, I was the son of a very famous man. I was doing very well at junior rugby. Um, and I certainly wasn't going to be a boxer. I tried that and, and realized that I didn't have the temperament or the hunger for it. And I don't know why, just in that little sweaty Indra club, Indra club I just fell in love with what I saw. I was listening to early Chuck, Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley, you know, just the, the British bands picking up on the American music, rock and roll music and R&B music, and interpreting in their in their way, Little Richard. All, all of those songs were being played. Plus, I heard some songs I'd never heard before, which were obviously early Beatles songs. And um, John and Paul, um, and George actually was too young. In fact, George got into trouble and had to be deported. Uh, <laughs> Because uh, Bruno uh, Grossemeiter, who was the club owner, the guys had agreed to go and play for the Star Club, and which was competition. So he got George deported in in the end. This was after, slightly after I'd met with him and got George deported because he was underage and shouldn't be playing in the club at, at the age of 16. At any rate, um, I went on down to Spain and to have a, had a, some time in Spain and Portugal and I can't remember exactly, but either I got in touch or my mother had got, I given them my mother's address. My mother had got a telegram that the boys had got a show at, this was for the cavern. They had a show at the, uh, a show at the iron door in Liverpool and come on up and, uh, just let's get together again. So I actually got hitchhiked on a cold steamer from Lisbon that was going to Port, uh, to Liverpool, and I worked my passage uh, shoveling coal on this thing, <laughs> and got got to Liverpool all looking like the chimney sweep, and um, met up with the guys. And um, what I'd felt fallen in love with at the Indra Club in September, this was now late November in Liverpool, which is cold and rainy. But I just went into this club and the heat and the and the, the, the music, and I just I I found my cocaine. I found my I'd <laughs> much found healthier my, than cocaine too. <laughs> right, well, we won't go there, but but uh, uh, I found my drug of choice, and it was the music. 